Hey, everybody, you can have a seat, have a seat. Hey, welcome. Um, welcome and glad you're with us this morning. So uh, my name is Travis, and I am our student pastor here at RCC. Pastor Nathan uh, is on a vacation with his family, and uh, we're so glad that he's able to spend that time away. And I'm excited to, uh, to get to, to speak to you this morning. So our church this year, we've been, uh, ha- we've been having a daily Bible reading or going through the Bible this year, and we're about there. We're about there. So uh, in, our, in our readings this week, there were several great things to talk about, but we read at the beginning of our week, we read uh, from the book of James or the whole book of James, and um, I love James. So that's where I wanted to be today. I wanted to uh, speak to you from the book of James. So if you have your Bible and you want to open it to there, we'll be there in a few minutes. I want to tell you a little bit about James first. So James is the brother of Jesus. Um, yeah, what was that like <laughs> to be the brother of Jesus? Can you imagine growing up in his home and mom and dad being like, hey, James, why can't you be more like your brother? <laughs> right? Like, it's impossible to, to, like, to be in his position. That's got to be a pretty hard position to be in, right? Because his brother is literally Jesus. And you can imagine him also, like, rolling his eyes at certain points and being like, oh, my brother thinks he is literally God. <laughs> like, <laughs> but the problem is, it's true, but we can find out in Scripture that James doesn't believe it. So James is growing up this whole time and in the home with Jesus, and he doesn't believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And we've got some verses that can tell us about that. So in Mark 3, 20 and 21, it says there that Jesus enters a house. This is young in his ministry. And uh, he enters a house and a crowd is gathered there. Uh, and so many that he and his disciples were unable to eat. So when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, and they said, he is out of his mind. Like, what in the world is is he doing? This is what Jesus' family, James included, thought about him when he started his ministry. So he is either uh, in a house that's so cramped that there's literally no room to eat, or instead of going home to be with his family for a meal, he stays to be able to minister and speak to these people. And either way, his family's going like, dude, you're a carpenter. What are you doing, right? James doesn't get it. Okay, so then there's this verse in John uh, 7, 1 through 5. After this, Jesus went around to Galilee. He didn't want to go to Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers come to him. So this is James and his brothers. Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the works that you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. So this is like totally a Joseph uh, moment here where his brothers are like, hey, those people want to kill you. You should go show yourselves to them, right? Like they don't don't believe what Jesus says. Is, is like, is talking about here. And they're like, man, you are putting a lot of stress on our family. You are changing our lives and bringing just a lot of like stress and shame into our home. So would you please just go ahead and go down to that festival and start saying all these things that you're saying so that they can figure this out, right? This is literally the tension in Jesus's home at that moment. And then, uh, so then we also have Mark 6, Beginning of Mark chapter 6, Jesus left there and he went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he went to the synagogue and began teaching, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did he get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that he has been given? What are these remarkable miracles that he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Isn't this the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus' response to this is like, yeah, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his home. And Jesus couldn't do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. So James and his brothers don't believe Jesus. Even after he starts his ministry and they start seeing what he's doing, they're like, what in the world are you doing? But now we have this book uh, in the scriptures and it's from James. So we know that James somewhere changes his mind. 
somewhere changed his mind. And I like to assume, with, there's this moment that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, I like to assume it's probably around this moment. Paul is listing a bunch of people that after the resurrection, Jesus comes back and he sees in person. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, it says, Jesus then appeared to James and then to all of the apostles. So again, imagine what that must have been like for James. He sees his brother on the cross and then all of a sudden the resurrected Jesus comes to see him and he's gotta be like, so you, it was, it was real the whole time? <laughs> like, you were literally God the whole time? Like, the, the, all of the stress of that moment, all of the denying him in that moment, it's gotta, it's gotta come out, right? And then if you're Jesus, like, or if you were, if you were like, I, I'd like to imagine that maybe Jesus said, yeah, so, um, I have been, I have been the whole time. And can we talk about that moment when you want, wanted me to go to Judea, <laughs> right? That, that like moment where you were like, oh yeah, totally go expose yourself to the people that want to kill you. Let's, let's, let's put it all on the table here since we're putting things on the table. But um, so th there is tension in this relationship, but because of that tension, when it resolves, when Jesus has this moment where he understands who his brother is, I think that that gives us the, this letter. He knows some things probably better than anyone else because he knows Jesus, maybe better than anyone else, any human on the earth. So, so when we get James's uh, epistle, it, it's, a, it's a general letter. So like Paul, a lot of the New Testament is written to specific places, like this one is to Rome and this one is to Ephesus and this one is to Corinth. But uh, James's is not like that. It's a general letter. So he wrote a letter to all of the believers. And uh, when it gets sent out, everyone makes a copy of it by hand because there's no printing press yet. And then they keep sending it and then they start sending copies. And that's how we have it today is that it got circulated on purpose. The wisdom of James gets circulated. And then um, that's, that's how it maintained and, and how we have it. So um, James's letter is one of my favorites uh, for new believers. So uh, if you're a new Christian, if you just got baptized and placed your faith in Jesus, the point of James's letter is to, for us to grow in our Christian maturity. So he doesn't talk a lot about like the, the gospel and the resurrection because he's, he's writing to people who already believe and he really wants them to, to mature in their faith. So it's great. Uh, for somebody who's been newly baptized. So um, we've had a lot of, of, uh, of those people here in the last year, which is, praise God, that's something to celebrate. We've had just over 100 people uh, place their faith in Jesus Christ through baptism here at RCC in 2021, which is fantastic. But wouldn't it be a tragedy if that was it? If that was it, if we were like, hey, great, yeah, thanks, you became a Christian, what, good for you, see you later, <laughs> bye, bye. All done now, we did our job, but that's not it, right? That James knows that that's not it, and we deeply know here at RCC that that's not it. Our mission statement is not just to win people. Our mission is to win people, train believers, and unleash disciples. We want your whole life to imitate or uh, to imitate Jesus and to be in followership with Jesus. We wanna win people, train believers, and unleash disciples. We're passionate about that mission here at RCC, and James is passionate about that same mission, and that's why he writes his letter. That's why it's important enough to write. So if you didn't, I know that this is the, like Christmas week and, and we were all super busy, so if you didn't get a chance to read the whole book of James this week, it's really short and I would love for you to take some time out of your week to just go back and read James. But today we're gonna focus on James chapter one, verses 19 through 27. So I'm gonna go ahead and start reading verses 19 and 20. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Okay, so already we're like, wow, <laughs> maturity, but that, like this is another level, right? This is already something that's super hard because we, we all have a, a reaction, right? We all have a reaction. So like we all wanna be quick to speak and throw in our opinion, but this is not what James wants us to do. He wants us to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Okay, and he says this because human anger, our anger doesn't solve anything and it can destroy everything, 
right? Human anger doesn't solve anything, and it can destroy everything. So, slow to speak, slow to anger. Most of us, that's not something that comes naturally to us, and James knows that, and he wants us to work on it. Uh, And we would agree with him. We know that that is wise, right? So, um, and we, we know that that's wise, but when we see something, especially on social media, right? Social media is one of those things that just makes us boil really quickly. It's like we can go from nothing to like on fire super quick. And uh, when that happens, like James is speaking to us today, right? So like, let's look at this quote together. Wow, your Facebook post about politics totally changed my mind. Yep, that's a great quote. Um, and um, here's who said it. No one ever. Yeah, right, it doesn't, our anger expressed online, it doesn't actually heal things. It doesn't bring wholeness to things. And James knows this, he's speaking to us about this. Okay, so another way that this makes sense is that, yeah, if you have gotten angry, like raise your hand if you've ever gotten angry, yep, me too, yep. Has that ever fixed your problem? Yeah, no, it hasn't, it hasn't fixed your problem. no, let me backpedal on that. It may fix your immediate problem, right? Your anger may actually like stop the argument or stop the fight or shut somebody down in the moment. But let me, uh, let me offer you this. It probably damages that relationship, right? Even if it fixes something in the immediate context, it probably damages that relationship. So think about that, like if, you, if you're married and you have a spouse, when you get angry and you yell at your spouse, is it ever like, oh man, they, they just appreciate that so much and they're gonna learn a lot from those words that I just said to them and they're gonna come back and just like, love me even more. Yeah, no, it doesn't do that. That's not what we expect anger to do, right? We, we instead should be slow to speak and quick to listen, okay? So think about that with like your kids or, or students in the room, younger kids in the room. Uh, when you're angry at each other, right? And you're like fighting with each other and you like get super angry. Does that heal your friendships? Is it like, like, man, I love hanging out with that guy because every time I hang out with him, he like pushes me and takes my toy and gets mad and throws a fit. Like, no, you, we don't want to be around that person, right? Because it doesn't heal our relationships. It, do, it doesn't bring wholeness to us. Anger doesn't fix anything, so uh, even in our jobs with our coworkers and with our bosses, there are things that, uh, that in our work life that we're like, man, this thing just makes me angry. But when we actually respond out of anger in that thing, it doesn't give us wellness in our work, right? It doesn't give us wholeness in our work. It destroys our capacity to love others at our work. Okay, so if you think this is you, maybe you're like, oh, okay, so I have some of these things, but I'm not sure. Here's what I would, I would love for you to do today. First, I would love for you to pray about it. Um, if you think that this is you if, you, if you've got like, yeah, maybe I need some more patience, maybe I need to listen better, just, just pray about that. And two, here's the next thing that I would love for you to do is ask three people with a faith that you admire for their take. Ask three people with a faith that you admire for their take. So I, I think this is just a great overall method for, um, for growing in our faith. If we put mentors around us or people around us who are wise and who have a faith that we admire and we can bounce things off of them, uh, like, hey, th- this, this trait, this quality that I see in you, can you tell me more about that? And this thing that I haven't quite figured out yet or I don't know how to, to get rid of this, can you help me with maybe how you have already done that? Right, this coaching, the, the community of the church that we have is awesome and God wants us to use it. So find three people with a faith that you admire and get their take on what's going on there. So um, overall, James is saying that human anger is sinful. He's saying that it destroys. It destroys our relationships. It stops the gospel from thriving in us, and it stops the gospel from being seen in us. So he says in uh, verse 21, therefore get rid of all moral filth. So he doesn't stop at just anger. He says, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is prevalent and humbly accept the word that is planted in you, which can save you. So um, uh, maybe your house has a mud room. Um, my house, the house I grew up in, did not have a mud room, but I still was a child who got really muddy. I played outdoors a lot. We were always in the woods. And when we come home with our clothes covered in mud, uh, there was no way that that mud was coming into the house, right? So my mom would always be like, mm-mm, 
we, we had the porch mudroom, and I'm like, Mom, I'm outside. People can see me. And she's like, yeah, but your clothes can't go inside. <laughs> so take them off on the porch. I will spray you with the water hose. Then you can come inside. And it's always like, Mom, <laughs> right? But this is what has to happen, and we know that. So now we build these mudrooms into our homes so that we can get clean. And if we care so much about our homes that we build these things for them or that we, like, have to strip down and get hosed off on the front porch, if we care so much about our homes that we do that, then how much more so should we be worried about the dwelling place of the Spirit of God? See, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. So that word temple, it it literally means the place where the Spirit of God dwells. So Paul in 1 Corinthians says, do you not know that your bodies are are the place where the Spirit of God dwells. So put off those nasty clothes and be clothed in the Spirit. This is what uh, James is saying here. He continues in verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. I mean, this has got to be like every preacher's favorite verse, right? Like, hey, you can, like, we, we, we say all of these wonderful things but then like there has to be an action component, there has to be an application component to this, right? I love this, but let me, let me be honest, this is hard for me too, right? It's easy for us to read the word and agree with it. Yes, you are right, my life would be better if I treated everyone with more kindness. But then we still get angry and we still get mud all over the place. And James knows this. He knows this and that's why he's writing. So. In 23 through 25, he says, anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is someone who looks at his face in the mirror, and after he looks in the mirror, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Okay, so this mirror analogy I actually love, uh, and that's because when we look into a mirror today, and then we look into a mirror tomorrow, it, it has changed. The, the actual mirror hasn't changed, but, but the person in it has changed, right? So over time, our clothes change and, and our style changes. Um, our hair styles change. The length changes. The color of our hair changes. The amount of hair changes, right? Everything that happens in the mirror is all about change. And James says, hey, when you look in that mirror, you go away and you forget who you actually are, but God's perfect law, it doesn't change. And that's who you really are. If you look to yourself, you look to yourself to discover who you are supposed to be, you'll never know. You'll never know. Because you're made perfect not by yourself, you are made perfect in God. It's in God that you are fully known, and it's in God that you were made who you were meant to be. Isn't that better? Right? Isn't that better? Doesn't it sound like freedom to not have to make all of our own judgments on everything and we can just trust in God's perfect law? That sounds amazing, doesn't it? So, but first we kind of have to know what is this perfect law? So I want to look at Matthew uh, chapter 22. There is a teacher of God's law that comes to Jesus, and he says, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Can you sum this up for me? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest command. And the second is, like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. Pastor Nathan, a couple of weeks ago, uh, summed this up for us. He said, all this can be summed up in two sentences, love God and love others. Love God and love others. This is God's perfect law. And then Pastor Nathan made it even simpler. And if everybody wants to put a hand up and make an L, we're going to do this. Uh, Some teens taught me recently that this also can be L-O-L. But that's not what we're doing this morning. We're going to do L1, right? L1, love God. L2, love others. L1, love God. L2, love others. So that's a simple method that he taught us just a few weeks ago uh, that, that applies this verse to our life. If we want to know God's perfect law, God's perfect law is to love him, to be in communion with him. 
right, to be a good son or daughter to our father. And then to represent him well, to love others well. James continues in verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and don't keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Man, he's really hammering this like slow to speak thing home, isn't he? Um, but it's good. Uh, and, and here's a little application for this one. So uh, my whole life I've loved cheeseburgers. Any, anyone else? Like cheeseburgers are your, yeah, I love, you know, like praise God for America and the American diet and that there is a cheeseburger to be found all over the place because I love them. But um, when I was a teenager, I ate cheeseburgers all the time. And with that growing appetite, I would just like stop all the time and grab cheeseburgers from the drive-thru. And uh, my mom would often say, you keep eating that many cheeseburgers and you're, one day you're going to look like a cheeseburger. And uh, at the time, I was like, oh, mom, you have no idea. And then I grew up a little bit, and my metabolism started to slow down. And then I looked down one day, and I was like, I'm starting to look like a cheeseburger. (laughs) Right? So we know this about ourselves, right? We are what we eat. Or if you want to feel good, you have to eat good. Or we can say it this way, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future, Right, so we know this, that we, we are who we hang around. The influences that we put around us, that's who we will become. The things that we put into our mind, that's what will come back out. That's what we will look like, okay? So it's all true. Jesus puts it this way, Luke chapter six, no good tree brings bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bring good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People don't pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. Uh, a good man, brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So what you are full of is what will come out of you. So my question is this, if we're full of God's love, then what does that look like? What does that look like? Well, James weighs in on that, uh, what that might look like here in verse 27. He says, religion, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Okay, I think he's right. That's what being full of God's love uh, looks like. But what he's saying here is that anyone will help you uh, back, uh, sorry, anyone will help someone who can help you back, right? You would do that. If you know that your, your help is going to be reciprocated, you're like, yeah, man, I'm in. And what James is saying here is love with no conditions. Help with no conditions. Help the ones that have nothing to offer, and then you will learn something about the love of God, who is for everyone, including the ones who have nothing to offer. So James watched his brother Jesus spend so much time with people at that time uh, that James probably thought had no value. Right? Jesus is pretty much always surrounding himself with people uh, that James would have said, like, hey, man, if you want to advance yourself, Jesus, you probably need to get a better class of friends here. Like, the people that are following you, they are not going to elevate you um, because that's who Jesus is. So James, the brother, sees this, and James understands probably better than most of us that when James himself had no capacity to show love to his brother, Jesus, Jesus loved him. When James rolled his eyes and antagonized his brother, Jesus loved him. When When James has absolutely nothing to offer him, Jesus loves him. And that's the kind of love that changes us. That's the kind of love that changes us. Uh, And I think that's the kind of love that changes James. But he wants you to try to put that in place. He wants you to give actions a try because he says agreeing with it is not enough. So an author that I like says this, you can't think yourself into a new way of living, but you can live yourself into a new way of thinking. Okay, I'm gonna say that one more time. You can't think yourself into a new way of living, but you can live yourself into a new way of thinking. 
Okay, so I know that we are kind of, we're being action heavy here, and some of you might be a little resistant to that, and you're like, hey, Paul says that it's, it's by faith alone that saves, and that's Romans 3.28. Paul says that it's by faith alone, and I, I think that James actually agrees with Paul here. I, I don't think they're at odds with each other like some might think. I think what James is saying is that, yes, faith alone saves, but a faith that saves is never alone. A faith that saves is never alone. It's always accompanied by our actions. It's always shown by our works. So it is that faith, but that faith displayed is actions, and we might need the actions to get there, is what he is saying. So if you're looking for something to try, a way to start, then um, I would love for you to fill out one of the connection cards in front of us, and there are room uh, on that card to, to say, yeah, I wanna, I wanna learn more about getting involved. There are a lot of ministries here at RCC that we would love for you to partner with us in serving those in need in our community. I also wanna offer you a more universal life hack that I don't know where, where I picked it up. I picked it up several years ago, but I've put it into practice in my life, and I think it's been transformational for me to understand what James uh, is trying to teach us here. So this thing is to, when, when I look at each person, I've trained myself to think in my mind, because it would be weird to say it out loud, so I just think in my mind, you are the beloved of God, right? So when I make eye contact with every person, can you imagine, like, in the grocery store, like, hi, sir, did you find everything you need? You are the beloved of God. Yes, I did find everything that I need, right? That's weird, but if you just keep that back here, and each person that you make eye contact with, you just think you are the beloved of God. I also switch that out sometimes for you are God's favorite person, you are God's favorite person. But everyone that I make eye contact with, I try to, try to, I've trained myself to think that before I enter into that conversation or before I enter into that relationship. And that, to me, has been super helpful. Um, to tell you about one moment that was helpful, I wanna tell you a moment from this last summer where I, I really wanted to be angry. Um, so we took our students to uh, the Jumbo Shrimps game this summer. And it was a family night, it was really awesome. Uh, for Aaron and I, we were still pretty new here at RCC, and we spent uh, the evening with a bunch of, of families of people in our student ministry watching the baseball game. And it was bring your dog night, and uh, we, I'm raising this little, um, I'm training a little hunting dog. It's a little Springer Spaniel puppy. So uh, he's still in the middle of training. He's very much a pup, but we took him to the Jumbo Shrimps game that night. Yeah, there he is. There he is. And um, uh, so, so Bramble is with us, and he's a pup, which means he has to use the bathroom like all the time. Um, and he was like sitting in everyone's laps at the Jumbo Shrimps game, and I didn't want laps to become bathrooms, so I was taking him pretty, pretty regularly like out to the little grass spot where he could uh, go to the restroom. And that grass spot is like right by the gate where you exit the baseball park. So I'm out there, seventh inning stretch, I've taken the dog out, and... Um, all of a sudden, outside the gate, in the middle of the road, I heard this yelling, and I, you know, my ears tuned into it, and I took a couple of steps closer, and I got angry at the situation. There was an um, older white gentleman that was standing in the middle of the road, blocking a car, and yelling obscenities and profanities and racial slurs at a younger black girl that was sitting in the driver's seat of the car. And my heart broke in that moment. <laughs> knowing that girl is the beloved of God and she does not deserve your hateful words. And I didn't know what they were for. I didn't know the situation, but I knew uh, that it had to stop. So I walked over uh, to an employee for the Jumbo Shrimps that was standing at the gate and I handed him the leash for my dog. It's like, hey man, can you, can you watch my dog? And uh, I started walking out to this man and all the more, I'm just getting all the more angry at him because he's not slowing down, he's not stopping, he's literally hitting the hood of her car and yelling at her. And I get close, and then I make eye contact. And in my mind, I go, you're the beloved of God. This man that I did not see as worthy in that moment because he was hurting someone that God loved, all of a sudden, because of this discipline that, that God has trained in me, I was able to see, hey, you are also the beloved of God. I still stepped in 
as many of us would do, and I still, you know, I squeezed myself in between him and the car, just put my hands up like this and said, hey, I don't know what this is about, but this, this, this is done, you're done. This is over, uh, this has to stop, you can no longer speak to that girl. And he stopped for a second, backed up a little bit because, I, you know, <laughs> he had to do this. Um, so he backed up a little bit and, um, and then he got really angry at me because he, I shut him down that quickly. And um, that's when I wanted to be angry again at him because all of a sudden those words that were directed at her were directed at me. Fingers were in my face and split was flying, spit was flying in my face and all those things. And all at that time, God has already prompted me, this is my beloved. So I put my hands behind my back and just repeated over and over again. I, I don't know why you're angry, but you, you are not allowed to speak to her anymore. You can yell at me for as long as you need to, but you're not allowed to speak to her anymore, and I will be here until it's, you're ready to, to go home. And it took a few minutes, um, and then I walked back over to the car, waited for the girl to calm down enough to roll down her, her window, and then we cried together. We prayed together. I just told her, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that this guy decided to treat you like that. But you didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. I learned the story. She didn't deserve it or earn it. And we, we prayed together and I told her, man, you are the beloved of God. He is too, right? He is too, but he needs to see it. He needs to see it, right? So in that moment, God wants him to see who you really are. And he can't if I would have responded with human anger. He couldn't have, right? So if power is used to shut down power, then all anyone learns is that we've gotta become more powerful. And that is not what James is teaching us here. He is teaching us that human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires, right? James knows that our anger, our selfishness, our sin, it doesn't solve anything, but it can destroy everything. It destroys our ability to love God and love others. Okay, so when James calls us to lean into our faith and live out the love of Christ, right, to see everyone always as the beloved of God, he knows that's going to be hard. Maybe about as hard as believing that your older brother is literally God. <laughs> and we can't actually love others the way that he has called us to until we, one, understand and receive his love for us, right? We have to know it. We have to believe it. And we can't actually love others until we live it out, until we treat others uh, the way that Jesus wants them to be treated. Agreeing that those are good things are not enough. We have to do it. Let me pray over us. God, I thank you for small moments like the one that I described that teach us about um, who you really are. I thank you for, for a simple discipline that somebody um, in, encouraged me to try years ago that has shaped how uh, I see people more and more uh, through your lens of love. And I thank you for the words of James who uniquely knows what it's like to be close to you and, and to not fully understand your gospel. And I, I pray for the person that's in this room this morning that struggles with that, that, that has grown up in a Christian home that has been around the church their whole life and they, they're, they're still skeptical and I pray that uh, just as James sees Jesus after the resurrection, that they can see you after your resurrection, that they can see proof that you are the Lord of all things, that you have proclaimed peace. And we can lay down our, uh, I, I guess, just, just our must to have to do it ourselves, to have to make every decision, to have to be big ourselves, and we can just trust in your big love and your big plan and in the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I pray for our body this week that as we go throughout this week that we can look people in the eye 
and declare that they are your beloved. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.